favorite season here on booktube that's right in january our subscription boxes are flooded with favorites lists that's booktubers chatting about their favorite books of the previous year we all know every year kayla makes her reading booktubers favorites video which is basically booktube's version of christmas and this year i'm jumping on the bandwagon but i'm gonna do things a little bit differently unlike kayla i'm not looking for the person who has the most favorites in common with me or anything like that instead i'm just gonna go through and have a look at my favorite youtubers favorite books and essentially we're just gonna keep an eye out for books that i have on my shelves unread and this is going to be the push I need to get through some of my TBR. Okay, so first up is Jenny, who was one of the first people I found on booktube and remains one of my favorite booktubers to this day. And in that video, she listed a lot of books that I don't like, but then she also listed two bipolar memoirs, one of which I read years ago and loved. The second book she mentioned was Haldol and Hyacinths by Melody Moezy. This is a book I have had on my shelf for years. I picked it up after I read The Roomy Prescription by Melody Moezy. This I read with my book club and it remains one of my favorite memoirs ever. That's the first book going on the TBR. Okay so the next book showed up three times on these favorite videos and that is A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed. Hannah from A Clockwork Reader, Cindy and Ali all adored this book. High praise from three of my favorite booktubers absolutely going on our list. Then speaking of Hannah there was actually another book on her list let me go grab it it's out on my YA shelf. That's as long as the lemon trees grow. This book here is a proof that I picked up from work when this book was first released and this is another book that has shown up several times of course on Hannah's video. I also saw them discussing it over on the Candid Book Club and several of the people in that book club. This was one of their favorites of the year. And Books and Jam. Books and Jam loved it too. This is one of those books I have been meaning to get to but I heard it's heartbreaking and it's gonna make me cry so I've been putting it off but no longer. So Before the Lemon Trees Go was hugely popular this year, but there is one book that's even more popular and that is, where is it? Amina Al Sarafi. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we're finally getting to this one. So this showed up on so many of my favorite booktubers favorites list. It showed up on Dead Good Book Reviews, Jess Owens, Thoughts on Tomes, and Erin Reads. I think that's the most four favorites videos and every single one of them said that this is just so much fun and I can't wait. Okay now Willow from Books and Bow actually said one of her favorite books of the year was a book that I bought entirely on impulse and that is Honey Bees and Distant Thunder by Raku Onda. I honestly don't know very much about this but if Willow says it's good it probably is. Oh I'm really excited about this we've got our first middle grade to add to the list. One of Mara's favorite books of the year was The Last Quintista, a sci-fi middle grade. I've heard both incredible and very mixed things about this one. But it was a Newbery winner and it just kind of sounds like something I might love. And of course I trust Mara implicitly. So this one's going on the list. So our list is looking good but I was so excited when I saw a couple of people mention a graphic novel I have been meaning to get to for so long. Both Nakia's Hideaway and Alison Pages said that they adored Garlic and the Vampire. This honestly just seems so fun and sweet. I mean we get to follow like an anthropomorphic garlic. Like she, she's alive and she's garlic. I cannot wait. I cannot wait for this one. Then this is kind of cheating, but a book that showed up in Beth's honorable mentions is one I've been meaning to get to. And that is The Daughters of Izdaha. I pre-ordered this book like early last year and I just never got to it. So I feel like this is the perfect chance. Then a book that is not on my shelves, so you might consider it cheating, but I have already pre-ordered it. That is Mammoth at the Gates. Both Bethany and Tammy said they loved it. From memory, this book is coming out in January. So as long as it does come out, I'm gonna add this book to the list too. Oh and actually speaking of Bethany she also had The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill on her list and this is a much beloved middle grade that I found secondhand and I've been meaning to get to for ages and I feel like as a children's bookseller I probably should have already read this so I'm definitely gonna take this opportunity to add another middle grade to the list. I'm just looking over at the stack that we are creating and it's getting a little hefty but there are two more people who mentioned books that I have on my shelves and both are books that I really really want to read. Marina is the wonderful Marina she put minor D Detail by Adania Shibley as her favorite book of 2023. And then finally, one of my new favorite channels who just released her favorites video, Redhead Reads. There was actually a handful of books on that list that I do really want to get to, but the one that has been on my shelf for the longest is Clara and the Sun. And I have this really beautiful version of it. And I haven't read it because I keep going back and forth on whether I think this is going to be a new favorite book or I'm going to hate it. I think it's about time we just read it and find out. Oh, okay. Yeah, now that I'm holding this up, this does seem kind of ridiculous. Like honestly, what's more January than giving yourself some unachievable goals? And I was gonna tell you that, you know, throughout the month if there's more books we can add more, but <laughs> I don't think that's gonna happen. Actually, you know what? I was packing up my camera when I remembered I actually do have one more book to add to this list. 
<laughs> oh my god. And that is thanks to Ali. She did also put Strong Female Character by Fern Brady on her list. But it is one of the ones that I'm looking forward to the most, so I feel like I feel like we just have to add it on. Oh my god, how many books is that then? Let's bring them back over. Bring them back. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm literally gonna fucking drop them. So we have Mammoths at the Gate, which I haven't got yet, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13. This is why my friend Sarah calls me too keen Katie. I suppose I should probably quit gas bagging and get started because there's a lot of reading to do. <laughs> oh Mara, I knew it. I knew you were not going to let me down. This book, The Last Quintista, is brilliant. It's so good. So before I get ahead of myself, what is this book about? Well, it's a middle grade sci-fi about the end of the world. It's set a few decades from now when capitalism and the climate crisis has obviously run amok. But strangely enough, it is neither of those things that ends the planet. Instead, Haley's Comet has gone rogue. A sun flare has sent her off course and she's heading straight for Earth. Our main character's name is Petra. She's a 12 year old girl and she loves spending time with her grandmother and she is a passionate storyteller. Her parents are fancy science people so they are among the very few people selected to be able to hop on a spaceship and leave planet Earth. And obviously Petra and her younger brother are going to come along with them. That does of course mean that they're going to be leaving their grandmother behind but Petra promises that she is going to take all of their stories that they've shared together to humanity's new home. Now this journey to a new planet is going to take centuries and so Petra and her family get put to sleep and there are some people who are going to basically live on the spaceship. They're going to have their own children and for generations these people will be taking care of the people who have been chosen who are asleep to populate the new planet. Now I don't want to say too much but essentially the people who are remaining awake on the ship in the centuries that they have been there, they've basically turned into a cult who have very different ideas about how this new settlement should go. Essentially, they believe that it was diversity and difference that led to wars and conflicts and everything wrong with Earth. And so if they can only remove all of those differences and diversities, both in terms of how people think, the stories we tell, but also in how we look, then humanity will finally be able to prosper in peace. Yep, it's basically a middle grade sci-fi set in space about fascism. And it is heartbreaking and so beautiful. It's written so beautifully, but it absolutely is a middle grade that I would say is appropriate for middle graders. Personally, as a children's bookseller, I would be recommending it to kids who are looking for, you know, some interesting themes explored, who are reasonably strong readers, not too sensitive, and I'd say around ages 10 to 14. So it's not one of those middle grades that is actually written for adults. I think this is definitely written with children in mind, but equally it's one of those kinds of books with so many layers and themes that adult readers like me are gonna love too. I love how storytelling is such a central element to this book. There are kind of hints of magical realism too, but I would describe this first as a science fiction novel. But even then the science fiction isn't overdone. Everything that is used is used to serve the story. And I know I sound like I've spoiled the book, like learning that a cult has essentially formed. Uh, sounds like it should be towards the end. It's not. The rest of this book though is about Petra trying to hold on to the things that matter to her, the things that are sacred to her. And so much of that revolves around storytelling and memory, remembering the people back on earth that mattered to her. Although this book did make me cry and it did make me gasp out loud. I personally don't feel like the dark elements of this book were overdone at all. Instead, I felt like it was a honest portrayal and exploration of fascism. This was an incredibly powerful and moving book. I don't know that it was necessarily perfect, but it was pretty close. And honestly, I feel like it was quite an ambitious project. I feel like, you know, a sci-fi middle grade book about fascism. <laughs> honestly, I think it could have very easily tanked and fallen apart. But at least for me, I felt like the author had a very clear intention with this book and having Petra, our main character at the center of it, she was honestly just the perfect centerpiece to hold all of this together. And she's the kind of character that I'm going to be thinking about for a long time to come. This is not necessarily the kind of book that I will recommend to every young reader, but I'm already thinking of a couple of our regulars who I know are going to adore this. And I can't wait to put this in their hands. What else is there left to say? Other than that, this is one of my favorite middle grade books that I've ever read. And thank you, Mara. Honestly, I feel a little sorry for the book that's gonna have to follow up this one. <laughs> I'm aware that this lighting is really very unsatisfactory, but I'm gonna be honest, 
so is this book. And this was one of the most popular books. And obviously taste is subjective. And to an extent, I can appreciate why people enjoyed this book so much. I think there's quite a lot to like about the writing if you like descriptive, metaphor-rich writing, which I often do. On top of that, this is a story that is exploring a lot of themes and pretty heavy themes at that. At the top of the list, I would say the major themes being explored in this book are misogyny and especially around women not being believed. And while I can appreciate the attempt <laughs> at exploring those themes, personally, I don't think that they were handled very well. I don't know how much to tell you about the plot because I feel like this is one of those books that I'm sure a lot of people are interested in reading, but essentially we're following a girl named Effie. We find out that when she was young, she was almost taken by the fairy king and she spent her life terrified of him coming back for her, but also of having nobody, even her mother, believe her. She's instead deemed crazy, given pills to help her sleep and to help her stop her hallucinations. She's in her first year of university and she really wanted to be in the literature kind of college, uh, but that is reserved for men only because women have feeble minds. She is, however, allowed to study architecture. So she's there, even though she kind of hates it. And personally, if I had to identify where this book fell apart for me, it was the romance. And that is not necessarily because I didn't believe the romance, I didn't get into it, or I didn't particularly like them together, although all of that is true. Instead, some of my major problems with it were to start with, the framing of this being a rivals to lovers. These two people are not really academic rivals. Instead, the young man, his name is Preston, he's just from a different country that Effie, our main character's country, is at war with. And there are some allusions to like a colonizing kind of dynamic here. And essentially, Effie is just this world's version of racist towards Preston. I'm using the word racist, I probably should be using like bigoted or xenophobic maybe, because obviously racism in our world has very particular connotations to it. Anyway, I didn't like that dynamic and I suppose vague spoilers, this is one of those books where <laughs> I'm laughing because it's just absurd, where Effie, our main character, doesn't really reckon with any of this bigotry that she has. Instead, she just is absolved of her bigotry because she falls in love with Preston. The other thing that I just hated, and it was at the beginning of the book, was that essentially when, you know, Effie and Preston are not getting along, uh, Preston basically asks Effie to help him find out some, like, uncover information about this author. And at first she doesn't want to do this because this author is her favourite author and then also Preston is a foreigner, so she doesn't trust him. But then he basically offers her something she can't refuse. He will help her get into the literature college. And he says some high and mighty feminist stuff about how outdated and backwards these rules are keeping women out of the literature college. And I think it's supposed to read as if, like, okay, he's cool, he's woke, so we can trust him. But instead, I'm just here thinking, if that's how you truly feel. If you think that these rules keeping women out of the college are backwards and sexist and wrong, why are you only willing to help Effie if she helps you? Do you know what I mean? Like that doesn't make you a good person. That's like peak performative activism if you ask me. Only helping somebody who is being oppressed if you get something out of it in return. But that is not the way that it is positioned in the book. And that's all I could think about the entire time. I do understand that this book is tackling some really heavy topics around the abuse of young girls and young women. And so I can totally appreciate why a lot of people are connecting with those themes and why they're connecting with Effie. The writing in this book relies heavily on metaphor and simile, and there is a very, very strong motif of drowning, of water. And I thought a lot of that was very effective in setting the tone, the atmosphere. That was one of the elements that I liked of the book. But the story itself, the characters and the themes, I didn't like how they were handled. I didn't like the execution. But I suppose all that's left to do now is to get stuck into the next book and keep your fingers crossed that I like that one more. You know she loves a book when she paints her nails to match. That's right I just finished Strong Female Character by Fern Brady and I had such a good time with this book. So Fern Brady is a comedian she seems like she's pretty well known in the UK. I personally had never heard of her but I became interested in this memoir when I heard that it was about a woman getting diagnosed autistic in her adulthood and I feel like this is one of those books that could very easily have sat on my shelf for a year or two before I finally got to it so I'm so happy that this video made me read it now because I really enjoy 
enjoyed it. Essentially we get to follow Fern from when she's a child right up until present day and we get to learn a lot about her childhood experience and in particular a lot of the framing is about the ways in which she struggled because she was undiagnosed autistic. But there's also some other topics of tension I suppose that we learn about too within her family and community environment. I'd say one of the main ones is especially around like the culture of very strict Catholicism in the small Scottish town in which she was raised but particularly in her family environment and how that was so steeped in a culture of shame. Shame about her body, about her sexuality, about her behavior and femininity more generally. There's also a lot of talk about class and access to education as well but primarily the center of it is her struggling with the behaviors and traits of autism that nobody recognized as such. As she gets into her young adulthood and leaves home we see how her struggles kind of change and how her situation results in her getting into sex work. I loved a lot about this book but I especially loved her framing and her discussion around that sex work as an autistic woman and she really pushes back on this kind of like one dimensional understanding of autistic women falling into sex work purely due to a lack of self-esteem and because they're being taken advantage of. And I just loved the way that she was so honest and she really provided so much nuance to that conversation around sex work, especially for people who are disabled. This book was very funny. I literally laughed out loud several times, but she did a great job at balancing that dark kind of gallows humor with a true sense of vulnerability and honesty throughout the entire book. I also really appreciated her exploration of anger and the way that she very vulnerably details, meltdowns for her, what they look like and how they impact herself and the people around her. Essentially there is nothing about this book that is pretty. I would describe this as gritty in a lot of ways in fact. And while there are some absolutely harrowing borderline like disgusting moments throughout the book that genuinely did evoke some really strong emotions in me. At the end of the day I finished this book just genuinely feeling so proud of Fern. Her commitment to honesty in this book I think is unparalleled. There are definitely some moments in here and some jokes in particular that I did feel like probably aren't going to date that well but that rawness was kind of all part of the experience. So I loved it. I just loved it. What a success. I hope you know I have tried very hard to make sure Ollie is in shot for you because She's so cute. <laughs> I am struggling a little bit with this video. I have to be honest. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you very briefly about the three books that I have DNF'd so far. And then we're gonna talk about the book that I just finished that I kind of wish I had DNF'd. So Honeybees and Distant Thunder is a story about a piano competition. And apparently it has these really beautiful, drawn out lyrical descriptions of music and of people experiencing music. But I mean, I only read 30 pages, so I barely even scratched the surface of all of that. Instead, the thing that made me stop reading was the writing. I just hated the writing. So often throughout the text, it's literally like one short sentence is the entire paragraph often for pages at a time. But it was often enough where this kind of really chunky, bite-sized, stilted kind of writing was honestly just really taking me out of the entire experience of reading. And it was so frustrating and like visceral to me that I knew I was just gonna hate the book and I was gonna really struggle to get through it. So I DNF'd it at like page 32. <laughs> okay, the next book I DNF'd I do have here. It's Haldol and Hyacinth, A Bipolar Life by Mel Melody Moeasy. And I was reading this on the lovely Jenny's recommendation. And I've had this book on my shelf for a couple of years because I read Melody Moise's follow-up to this book a couple of years ago. It's called The Roomy Prescription. And it's one of my favorite memoirs I've ever read. This book, I can absolutely appreciate why Jenny got so much out of it and why it meant so much to her. So I don't want to take away from that at all. For my part though, it was just such a different book to The Roomy Prescription. Like honestly, I wouldn't have guessed that the same person had written it. And frankly, it just doesn't have any of the warmth or the focus or any of the like the sense of reflection that the roomy prescription did and that made me love the roomy prescription so much. So I did really try, I DNF'd around 160 pages. The next book I DNF'd was The Daughters of Izdaha, which is a book I pre-ordered last year and I was so excited about. Alas, I only got 42 pages in before I gave up. It's a feminist fantasy story inspired by modern Egypt and apparently it's sapphic but I didn't get that far. <laughs> you really are kind of dropped right into the story and the plot and there's very little fluff here. I hope it's not too harsh to say but at least in the first 42 pages I was feeling like this could be set anywhere anytime. There was no distinctive character to the setting at all and maybe that is more than enough for some of you but for me absolutely not. I am somebody who needs atmosphere and character development and investment and so plot heavy fantasy I just don't think is for me. Which brings us to the book that I did finish and I thought I was gonna love but I really didn't and it was 
Amina Al Sarafi. Oh no! I was really enjoying, I'd say, the first quarter because I love the characters. The characters in this book are so good. I really love Amina and I love so many of the characters she surrounds herself with. And I loved the relationship she had with her daughter. However, I did not enjoy this as a story. And I know that this will make no sense, but to me it kind of felt like if you cross The Witch King by Martha Wells with Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. And if you've been around here, I DNF'd both of those books because they were boring as hell to me. This book did succeed in a way that neither of those two books did in making me fall in love with the characters. But at the end of the day, these kind of like quest adventure stories I don't like them. And like, it's supposed to be fun. This is supposed to be fun. And so many people use that word to describe it. It's fun, it's rompy, it's a great time. Unless apparently you're me. I didn't even tell you what this book is about. It's basically like a quest heist fantasy book about some pirates who are mostly retired, but then get an offer that they cannot refuse to kind of get the band back together and go out on the oceans a question. Now I still have a handful of books that are options for us to get to, but I would be lying if I told you that I wasn't feeling a little bit down about this reading project right now. I don't know what to say at this point other than please pray for me. <laughs> so I know we've been a little down in the dumps in this video, which means I could not be happier to tell you that I have a new favorite graphic novel series. And this is a graphic novel that I've been meaning to get to for a while. We stock it at work. So I like, I have very easy access to it, but you know what the thing was that was holding me back? I didn't know which was first. <laughs> I didn't know which was the first book. I didn't know which one you were supposed to start with. And don't ask me why I thought it was so difficult just to look up. I don't know, man. It was just this tiny barrier of entry that kept me away. But this video was the push that I needed. And oh my God, am I glad to finally have gotten to these books. And yes, both of the booktubers said that this was their favorite, but I couldn't help myself. I read both in one sitting. So the first book is Garlic and the Vampire. So I started with this one. And basically in this series, we get to know Garlic, who is like this little humanoid garlic figure. She and a bunch of other veggies were brought to life sometime in the past by a very sweet nice little witch who needed a bit of help in her garden. It's very cute all of the veggies have their own personalities. Garlic though is quite an anxious little character but she's kind of thrust into a situation of having to be brave when a vampire moves into a castle nearby and all of her veggie friends are like well somebody's got to go and check in on the vampire and you know make sure that he's not up to no good and of course garlic literally being garlic she's the one who's got to go. And so while yes, she is terrified, she decides that on behalf of her friends, she's going to make sure that they're all safe and march right up to that castle door and knock on it and ask to talk to the vampire. And I will just say that what she uncovers is delightfully unexpected. These graphic novels are the kind that just fill your heart to bursting with how sweet and wholesome they are. And honestly, while I do understand why people's favorite was The Garlic and the Vampire, I loved both and I'm so glad that I read both together. I think because they're so short, it took me like literally 40 minutes or something to read each volume, that getting to spend just that little bit longer with these characters and with Garlic in particular definitely did heighten my experience overall. I felt very immersed. I was obsessed. I was like kicking my feet giggling with how sweet everything was. They're the kind of sweet and wholesome stories about community and love and celebrating each other that are just like perfect for fans of K. O'Neill. If you're a fan of the Tea Dragon Society, like you absolutely need to give these a go. It is a very different art style, obviously, to the Tea Dragon Society, but it's similar vibes. And I feel like if you're a Tea Dragon fan, it's the vibes that you're after. So I wholeheartedly adored these. And like I said, these are going to sit comfortably on my like mental shelf of favorite graphic novels alongside the Tea Dragon Society, Lightfall, and Lily Half Moon. So obviously I'm thrilled. I'm so thrilled to have found a new favorite graphic novel series, but equally I'm just chuffed that this video, it feels like we're turning things around. After three DNFs, I really needed this. I finished Minor Detail by Adania Shibley today and oh, I don't even know <laughs> if I have the words to be able to talk about a book like this. So what is this book about? It's written by a Palestinian author and it is following two different women at two different points in time. So the first half of the book is told from the perspective of an Israeli soldier in 1949. And the third person narration following his perspective all feels so robotic and mechanical. But there are several things that kind of show up in repetition and become motifs throughout the entire book. But essentially for a lot of it, we're following him in his very like mundane everyday tasks. But those are almost interrupted by some of the atrocities he and his men are committing. One of them includes the kidnapping gang rape and murder of a young woman. Now a lot of it is on page, but I think because it's from this Israeli soldier's perspective, third person, it's 
it's very detached from the emotional weight of what's happening and it just kind of like happens and then the next thing you know he's like washing himself or he's out on a patrol or he's trying to sleep like it's almost written as if it is such like an everyday mundane uninteresting thing then the second half of the book is told in first person from the perspective of a palestinian woman decades later and basically she comes across uh, some historical record of what had happened although the historical record doesn't really focus on the atrocity all that much and it doesn't detail who this woman was in any way essentially her story is lost to history and obviously is framed by the Israelis who are the people who are more or less telling this story and so we follow her as she seeks out more information on this woman and what happened to her I think what this book does really effectively and so deliberately is essentially highlight the way that Palestinian people and in particular in this case Palestinian women have been and continue to be dehumanized and experience so much colonial violence at the hands of the Israeli settlers and some of those motifs and repetitions that we saw in the first half of the book do kind of seep in and translate over into the second half of the book decades later and so while yes the atrocities are clearly like the horrible part of the book it was almost those repetitions and the echoes of them throughout the decades that like hit me more in a way which I think speaks to the intent of this book highlighting the fact that occupation colonialism is an ongoing project that both necessitates and justifies violence against indigenous people and against women this is the kind of book that I cannot say I enjoyed it was disgusting and horrific and haunting but equally it's the kind of book that's going to stay with me you know I did find myself as a reader feeling almost like angsty and like I just wanted the book to be over and for her to get to the point because I, I more or less knew what was happening and I more or less knew what was coming for both halves of the book for the entire book but I think essentially what I was experiencing was like an uncomfortability with sitting with the realities of Palestinian experience both in the past and today and just like the casual everydayness of the violence if that makes sense I suppose the author just did an impeccable job of capturing the insidiousness of colonization so while I can't quite see myself putting this on like an end of year favorites list equally I can totally appreciate why Marinez put it on hers so while this continues to linger in the back of my mind I'm sure for months probably years to come I'm gonna go settle down with like a middle grade or something <laughs> friends we are nearing the home stretch today I actually finished two books the first one was the girl who drank the moon which as I mentioned is a middle grade I've been meaning to get to for ages now if I'm being entirely honest I was a little disappointed by this one I think it's lovely I think it's beautifully written just for whatever reason it didn't quite capture me in the way I was expecting it to I really loved the setup in the first part of the book and I actually really liked the ending and how everything wrapped up but I would say the middle third like the middle 200 pages did just drag for me but the setup is amazing so let me tell you about that basically we're introduced to this town called the protectorate and it sounds like it's almost like in this compound it's essentially run almost as like this dictatorship by just a handful of elders each year the elders select a baby to take from their parents and to leave out in the forest as a sacrifice to the evil witch and even though everybody acknowledges that it's a sad thing they just accept that it is what is necessary in order to keep the town safe and a witch does come each and every year but she has no idea why this town keeps leaving out babies every year and so she travels to this same spot again and again to rescue these children so I just loved that setup I loved it so much and obviously then we have a little bit of a lingering mystery about what the hell is going on with this town and why they're sacrificing their babies but we also learn more about the history of magic in this land and we get to meet like a dragon and like this bog creature like I said I loved that setup and I really loved a lot of these characters and I did really Really like where the story ended but for whatever reason it just felt like it was a little bit too long for me it just didn't really draw me in quite as much as I wanted it to but I definitely liked it a lot and I can see why Bethany loved it the next book though was a book I wasn't sure if I was going to love or to hate and one of the main complaints is I've heard people say that like just nothing happens in this book but I'm so happy to tell you that I loved it I loved it so hard honestly the vibes of this book remind me a little bit of the sea of tranquility I mean they're entirely different stories both are very like lit fic light sci-fi speculative and while they have fun with those speculative elements 
their priority and their focus is character. Essentially this is like some unspecified near future where AI and genetic engineering are commonplace. And the entire book is told from the perspective of an AF or artificial friend who are these like artificial intelligent robot android things who serve as friends to teenagers. And our main character Clara is one of these artificial friends and the very first part of the book, the first 40 or so pages, we spend with her in the store where she's basically like waiting on display for a teenager to select her. And obviously I'm not super spoiler sensitive so I know that sometimes I share stuff that people consider spoilers but honestly I don't know how much to say because part of the joy of this for me was just like watching it all unfold. Because while Clara is an artificial intelligence and she's obviously hugely smart, it's clear that she has been programmed in such a way that prioritizes more social things and there's just massive gaps in her knowledge of the world. She and the other artificial friends are also solar powered so her kind of like gaps in knowledge combined with that fact end up in her developing this really interesting almost religious relationship with the sun. I just loved the way the world building was done in this book because obviously it is a different society with AI and genetic engineering but because this whole book is from the first person perspective of Clara whose primary motivation and focus is on serving her teenager she does pick up bits and pieces about the world but it's not like we get any info dumping explaining different elements of the political and social climate. Clara hears other people talking about things but obviously they already know what they're talking about so they don't sit down and take the time to explain it to us. And so the way that this all just unfolds was so like gentle but intentional. It was one of those reading experiences where I felt like as soon as I grasped onto something I felt like the author was giving me. It was almost at that same instance where I finally grasped onto something he had been building. The perspective on that same thing immediately shifted and transformed in front of my eyes. I suppose because Clara is a robot herself she sees things in shapes and you know how like with 3D sculptures they can look one way when you're looking on at one perspective but then when you come around from a different angle it looks completely different. That's how the themes within this book felt throughout the entire narrative and it just felt so intentional and honestly masterful. Even the characters and the way that we learnt about them in an unfolding kind of way, Clara herself does not feel like a judgmental point of view but as a reader I felt very judgmental of some characters but the characters that I hated at the beginning I felt very differently about by the end and not because there was some like big redemption arc but simply because we learnt more about how messy and complicated and intricate this world was. There was a sweetness and a naivety that Clara herself brought to this story which meant that nothing about the theme exploration or the exploration of this near future potentially dystopian world felt didactic and it certainly felt like the author was asking a lot of questions by situating us in that perspective but it also just felt like the author was almost doing this thought experiment of allowing us to experience this potential future world which led us as the reader to ask ourselves a whole bunch of questions about technology and our relationship to it and to each other. I just I loved it I cannot express to you how much I loved this and it's one of those books that I really enjoyed reading it but it was after I finished it that I was like oh my god I love that book and the more I think about it the more I love it and immediately I wanted to reread it. Honestly if you have some comp titles for this this kind of like slow subtle gentle literary sci-fi along the lines of Sea of Tranquility and Clara and the Sun, please, please give me your recommendations. I need more of this in my life. I just loved it. Okay, so our list of books that we have read is getting high, which means we have just one book left. And everybody says that this book makes them cry, so I'm gonna go get myself some tissues and then get to reading. I finished As Long As The Lemon Tree Grows last night and... <sighs> I I get it. In this book we meet 18 year old Salama who lives in Syria and she has been at university studying to become a pharmacist. But when the Syrian revolution begins and the regime responds violently, many of the doctors and nurses are murdered or kidnapped or have to flee. Which means people like Salama with some medical knowledge even if it's only you know quite limited end up being put in positions of essentially having to fulfill the role of doctors and nurses. And that is exactly what we see happen to Salama. And basically she's just trying to do her best to help her people while also stay sane herself and stay safe. And this book has kind of like a psychological slash 
magical realism element, depending on how you look at it, I suppose, where basically her anxieties, her fear, her PTSD, her current trauma, because it's not in the past, are almost made manifest into a character. So an awful lot of this book does detail many of the horrors around the revolution and the regime's violent response. But there is also a very sweet, almost like soulmates kind of romance that develops. And I'm not usually one for a soulmates kind of thing, and I don't think they ever use that word, but like that's just kind of how it feels. Two people who were meant to find each other do in the midst of so much horror. And it's almost because of all of that horror that their relationship develops quite quickly because both of them know that tomorrow is not promised. And obviously the romance is a big part of the book but I think another massive element of the tenderness and the love comes from the clear love that these characters have for their homeland. That even though a big part of this book centers around the question of whether or not they should flee, ultimately nobody wants to leave their home. If they could they would all choose to stay. And it's clear that the author has put in so much intention and research into constructing this narrative. It's so clear that there is so much care here. I wouldn't go so far as to say that this is a new favourite book for me but as a children's bookseller I am really really happy I finally got around to it and I will more than happily hand sell this at work from now on. But with all that said we are now finished. We have finally made it all the way through this video. Now obviously I have not been able to get my hands on Mammoths at the Gates yet by Nevo because it's not coming out until the very end of January and I was hoping to get this video up before then so we'll just have to read that book another time. So I know we had some mixed results with three DNFs and a handful of books that I probably should have DNFed. Then I had four books that I did really enjoy and that I'm really glad that I read and then we had four that honestly feel like favourites to me. I know it's only January, I know we're right at the beginning of the year, but I would not be surprised to see some or all of these on my favourites video come the end of 2024, which is just a really nice feeling. Okay, am I gonna try and hold them all up again? No, no, oh, oh, there we go, they're all in frame. <laughs> Now I do have a couple of other video projects planned that I'd like to do around booktubers end of year content and if you've made it all the way to the end of the video I mean why don't I just tell you tell you what those videos are as like a little treat for sticking with me all the way to the end. I've got two more videos that I want to do along these lines. The first is reading the books that I bought while watching booktubers favorites videos. January is always the worst month of the year for me in terms of how many books I buy just because everyone is talking about their favorite books and I just get so excited. So yes while I am trying to focus on reading my own TBR. There were, there were a handful of books that I did pick up based on other people's recommendations of their favourites. So that's one video. The other one is reading people's least favourite books, the books that they hated last year. Like this video, I'll be focusing on the books that I already have on my shelf, but we will be choosing from people's worst books of 2023 videos. All of the creators that I mentioned in this video will be tagged in the description box below, and I've made a playlist of the videos that I referenced in this video. Obviously, I have plenty of other favourite creators too, but either they didn't put out a favourites video in time or I missed it, or for a lot of them I just didn't have any of their favorites on my shelf to read. But anyway feel free to check out that playlist below if you'd like some more recommendations if you want to hang out with some more booktubers. If you haven't already and you've made it all the way to the end I feel like I can ask you to hit subscribe. If you're still here after 40 minutes you're clearly enjoying your time and I would love to have you back. A big thank you as always to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon and especially big thank you goes to Livia, Lynette Brown and Marie. But that's enough from me I will see you in the next video until then happy reading. Bye!